Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here in this warm, cozy space, a refuge from the bitter cold, uh, for our reading with a brilliant Shara McCallum. Uh, this is our first KR Reading Series event for the semester, and it is a real honor to have Yay. Shara with us, yes. <laughs> uh, beginning the series for us. I'm Elizabeth Dark, Associate Director of Programs here at the Kenyon Review, and before I introduce Shara, I'd like to highlight a few of the up upcoming events that we have on our calendar. Uh, this time next Tuesday, in this room, the poet Ed Skoog will be here. Uh, this is in collaboration with the English Department. And then Tuesday, February 26th at 410, we have a panel of poets who will be, again, in this room. Um, Hanif Durki, Eloisa Amescua, and Emily Youngman Yu uh, will be here, all three of them. This is part of our ongoing co collaboration with Hanif and his reading series in Columbus entitled From the Language of Ash, which if you will remember last semester brought us the Euler Lovelace. Um, so those are a couple of our next readings, but please do take a look at the Kenyon Review reading series calendar <coughs> on our website, www.kenyonreview.org, uh, to note the other things that are coming throughout the semester. But enough about that, you are here today to listen to Shara. So before I introduce her, can we please check to make sure our cell phones are silenced? Does anyone say cell phones in there? What did people say that? Just phones. phone. Oh. Oh. <laughs> smartphone, you don't call it a smartphone. Um, I'll also note before I introduce Shara that the uh, Kenyon Review Bookstore is, or sorry, the Kenyon College Bookstore is here in the back of the room to sell Shara's books after our Q&A, which will follow the reading. Um, and Shara has agreed to stick around for a while if you would like for her to sign one of your books. All right. Shara McCallum was born in Jamaica to an African Jamaican father and a Venezuelan mother and moved to the United States with her family when she was nine. Shara is the author of five books of poetry published in the U.S. and U.K., and her most recent collection, Mad Woman, was winner of the 2018 OCM Bocas Poetry Prize for Caribbean Literature and the 2018 Sheila Margaret Motley Book Prize. Her work has been published in the U.S., the Caribbean, and <coughs> Europe, has been translated into several languages, and has received such recognition as the Witter Benner Fellowship from the Library of Congress, and a poetry fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. Formerly the director of the Stadler Center for Poetry at Bucknell University, McCallum is now a liberal arts professor of English at Penn State University. Her work considers the intersections of race, gender, history, and personal identity. Please join me in welcoming Shar. Hello, how are you all? You're awake. That is excellent. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Anna and Elizabeth and David and everybody involved with making this happen. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I just want to say, Elizabeth, I don't think anyone has ever given an introduction in recent times and said, Shara McCallum and Witzer Binner. Kudos. <laughs> People struggle a lot with those syllables and the pronunciation of those vowels. I had to um, look up with her dinner. Yeah. So in the I I I you know answer to most anything, so it's cool. All right. I'm gonna read some poems, all from Mad Woman, and then we're gonna chat. Memory. I bruise the way the most secreted most tender part of a thigh exposed, purples, then blues. No spit shine shoes, I'm dirt. You can't wash from your feet. Wherever you go, know I'm the wind, accosting the trees, the howling night of your sea. Try to leave me, I'll pin you between a rock and a hard place will hunt you even as you erase your tracks with the tail ends of your skirt. You think I'm gristle begging to be chewed? No, my love, I'm bone. Rather, the sound 
bone makes when it snaps. That ditty, lingering in you, like ruin. I like to start with that poem, and since I'm sort of obsessed with the concept of memory, um, I'm gonna range around a bit now. I decide usually when I stand up in front of people what I feel like reading next, which is sort of funny, I think, but it's how I like to do it. Um, and I think I wanna read some of the poems that are in the middle of the book, um, including the poem that was published by Kenyon Review, for which I was very grateful. Um, I want to say this book has been out for two years. Hard for me to believe that already. Time just kind of keeps going, ticking along. Um, but in particular, I read from this in the United States. There's a UK version, and I read from it first in Jamaica in December of the year before this came out, 2017. But I read from this US version in Washington, DC, outside of Washington, DC, at a place called the Writers' Center in Bethesda. Some of you know where that is, lovely place. Um, I read from it the day after the Women's March had occurred. And I want to say that none of the issues, I think, that this presidency has brought to light are particularly new. And um, the evidence of that for me is um, long and I have a long version or view of history. But also when I began to read these poems right after what I considered one of the great travesties to occur in American civic and political life, it occurred to me that they sounded as if they were responsive, which is the funny thing about poetry, right? That you write it out of one set of considerations and concerns, and that it can take on all of these other echoes and resonances. I just say all that because I want to just emphasize how much I think that the struggle for equal rights and for citizenship is a long going process in American history. It's, it's not a particularly new one, even though it feels very much acute right now. Um, other thing you need to know before I read these two points. I was raised Rasta, which is a branch of, um, I was raised in the 12 tribes of Israel, a branch of Rastafarians in Jamaica. So I think that's why this is a Rasta Medusa. And um, Medusa, I'll let you know who she is, right? What can you tell me about how she became a warden? I love reading this. It's like the Q&A part of the reading now. <laughs> for you, not for me. That's coming after. <laughs> you remember anybody? Yes? Was it she was raped by Poseidon? I forget. That's exactly Which right. One. Yeah, and then I forget what goddess she was the name of, but was cursed as a gorgon because they're supposed to remain virgins. Yes, exactly. She was in Athena's temple where Poseidon raped her, and Athena punished her for not remaining a virgin as a consequence of going ahead and getting herself raped, I guess. Um, so, this is a long time problem. Mad woman as Rasta Medusa. I woman got turn all of Babylon to stone. I woman is the deliverer and the truth. Look upon I and feel your inside calcify. Look upon I and witness the chasm, the abyss of yourself rupture. Look upon I and know what bring destruction. You say I woman is monstrosity, but is you grab a vicious ways, make I come the way I come. Is your belief everyone exists to satisfy your wanton, wantonness? You think all these years gone, I woman will come here for revenge? Well, yo, but is wrong. Again, you're wrong. I woman is the reckoning and judgment day. This face etch with wretchedness, these dreads writhing and hissing misery is not the terror. I, woman, is what burnt from your terror. How old is your daughter? Hi. Hello. <laughs> no. It's very good you're coming to a poetry reading. I have two little ones, but now they're 13 and 15. They wouldn't consider themselves little. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read all of you, and thank you again, Kenyon Review, for first publishing this poem. 
Um, because I think, you know, the history of sexual assault and responses to it are varied. That poem has, the one you heard, has one kind of tonal register, which is righteous anger. This poem has a very different tonal register. Both of those for me are true. Oh, abuse. When I try to locate you, I think maybe you are lodged in my scapula like ill-formed wings. When I listen for your voice, I hear a faint lullaby of razors and knives, still fainter. You are my first darkness, but I continue wanting to see you as a sapling, greening and tendrilling. I am perhaps naive enough to believe if I could unlock your origin, I would glean knowledge of what separates a spirit from itself, of what makes each of us sometimes that creature of no good, of pure whatlessness. Oh, abuse, you swallowed the sun when you came, but also taught me it never shines for any of us exactly. A gift I have thanked you for many a time since. So no, I am not calling you here to account for your sins. What use would that be to either of us, travelers, Landed so far from where we began. No, I am asking you to step into the light so I may finally behold your face. And please, when I speak the only name for you I have, please, just once, answer. All right, so I'm going to switch it up. There are only a handful of poems in this book that have any humor. And so I'm going to read one of those now, because this is the part of the reading, which is very different than the writing, where I become deeply aware of your presence, and I feel an obligation to you now to give you some relief from what is the usual tyranny of my brain when I write poetry, and it's bent toward elegy. So I'm going to get to the elegy, but um, I'm going to back up and read a poem that I think is kind of playful. It has some sadness, too. I'll, I, I'll tell you that. Um, my older daughter went to that reading with me at um, the writer's house I mentioned, and I read this poem there, and I wasn't sure if I should read it. It's kind of long. It's a prose poem. And when I finished the reading, she said, that was the best poem you read, Mommy. You have to read that every single reading you give now. So I haven't quite um, fulfilled that obligation, but I'm going to give it a shot again today. Ten things you might like to know about man-woman. One, the source of her rage and joy are the same, which is true of many people where she's from, who, at one point or another, have not had a pot to piss in. Two, like everyone, she has her flaws. For instance, she's convinced of the importance of her own grief. Three, in her own mind, she sometimes moonlights as the earth. As a girl, she once built a raft from Brumaho masking tape and her own foolishness. Three B, this may or may not be true, but sharks wouldn't go near it anyway. Four, for instance, she really loves Abba and thinks Chiquitita was written for her personally. If you know the song or might care to Google it and listen on YouTube, even if you don't understand why she persists in this delusion, she hopes, despite your better judgment, taste in music, and or profound sense of ironic detachment, that you will love it. Five, while she has little actual faith, having lost most of it somewhere in a gully, 
perhaps in a big rainstorm that took place sometime in her childhood, which is her usual guess for everything, and therefore cannot in good conscience recommend to you the act of praying, she has nonetheless cultivated a deep belief in the color red, as in the poppy, which she admires since it seems harnessed to nothing but its own fiery display. Seven and a half. She has already grown tired of this list and is irritated with herself, not you, that she is now obligated to four or five more disclosures, <laughs> depending on how you're counting. Six. She is concerned details of her past make people uncomfortable. For example, her father was crazy, and not just in the colloquial sense. For example, he killed himself. 5b. It might be better to be a gardenia, less showy. This is what she thinks on the days she's not admiring the poppy. 6b. Since she's told you this story of her father, she wants to assure you she is fine now, which you might conclude anyway if you met her, because she smiles a lot. Seven, she has problems distinguishing fact from fiction. Eight, also, she's concerned lists are way too postmodern. <laughs> a theory which at first she thinks is shiny as a new penny, then quickly finds annoying and infectious, like sand flies. She wants to assure you this is true, even if she is mixed race from a host of nations, the sum of a bunch of world religions, and born in 1972. Anybody know when the term postmodern was coined, by the way? Like an SAT question for you. 1972. 8B. <laughs> now that she's alluded to literature and theory, she's a bit alarmed. You might begin to think of her as a character in a story. On the other hand, she likes stories very much, especially those rarer ones in which women get to be the heroes. So if you can't help yourself, then she thinks it would be okay, but asks that you please make her a myth. 5C. <laughs> or would it be better to be a cricket, she wonders. She's primarily thinking of the chirping kind when she asks herself this. But if your brain hears cricket and jumps to the sport, then items number one, three, and five will likely carry different meaning for you. Nine, she's pleased the numerical value of the Hebrew word chai, meaning life, is 18, because she happens to have been born on October 18th. She's always liked coincidences, like this one, or that her name means poetry and song, Hebrew again, or that she emigrated from Jamaica to the US on the day of Bob Marley's funeral. She thinks 18 must therefore be an omen, which is useful, because even if she doesn't believe in signs, this gives her an exit strategy. And she's always heard it's a good idea to quit while you're ahead, <laughs> presuming you're ahead, 10. <laughs> Okay, now she's concerned that last item was too hopeful, too perfect, or was trying too hard. All of the above, or none of them. She can't quite put her finger on it. Tendi. But more importantly, she's worried that if you've been paying attention, you've likely figured out she's confused about many things. For example, math. God, the hegemony of ice cream over all other desserts, memory, parental love, her
her defense of wearing dresses in winter, all endings, but notably those of poems and people, winter itself, all other types of love, the universe, origins, eternity, and so on. All right, that's the end of that long poem. That's it. There's a really long poem in this book I'm not reading. Do not worry. We would be here till the windshield becomes dangerous. <laughs> so, mm. my daughter pointed out to me, oh, by the way, the West Indies whooped the ass of the British at the most recent cricket match, for those yes. of you who care. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And um, I actually, you know, I don't watch cricket religiously anymore, but I was so watch, yes. I grew up watching it. Um, the other thing that's funny is my daughter who told me to read this poem, she said to me, you know what I think when you say cricket? The cell phone company. And I was like, right. I woke up and I thought I was being so hip by putting like YouTube in a poem. <laughs> showing how women I am. <laughs> Already ahead of me. All right. Um, so I said, I'm going to read some elegies, and I don't like to lie, and so I'm going to read some elegies. Um, the thing about the mad woman, which is the figure who runs throughout this book, and she's a version of me, everything in that poem is true, um, all of it, um, so I just thought, what do you do if you take your autobiography, as I've done my whole life, and really look at it from a third person angle in that case, but um, what's the use of that? How do you make something of that? is the question that interests me with the use of autobiography as a poet. Um, but I think, you know, um, one of the pervasive subjects that I, I feel like is a misunderstood subject for me all of my life is death. And it's the one that we all struggle with in a lot of ways, I think. Um, my father did die um, when I was young, just a few days after I came to the U.S. And um, I thought I'd worked through a lot of that, you know, and then my grandparents who raised me in quick succession both died. And that was very difficult, and I was much older. And so what I learned is just nothing really, except about my own hubris, um, in thinking that there are any answers. So these poems don't have those, I'm sorry, um, but they do have maybe just some questions or some thoughts that lingered with me in that period of time I was going through this. So I'll read, I'll read maybe just a, a handful of those before I'll flip back to some different poems. Um, elegy. First you told me, let's not cross that bridge till you come to it. But tumors bloomed in you the way a hawk plucks prey without conscience or malice. Then you said, what to do? Every way you turn, maka juke you. And your body's betrayals grew abundant. Face bloated as a puffer fish, legs dangling like a marionette's. Then you said, every day a fishing day, but is not every day you catch fish. And I asked myself, who, if I could, would I follow into the world of the dead? Which was the wrong question, whose answer I already knew. At the time, I believed love meant I could not, not look. Now, I am sure of little, but death is like an ill-fitted suit that can be worn longer than we'd imagine. Elegy Blues. You prickling as the thorn bush, you clouds effacing the sun, you dogging me like the casarina flogs the wind. You, so long, so gone, no more, see you later, alligator. You, not in a while, crocodile. You, not now, 
not ever, you, now never. Grief, the thing that keeps going and going. I linger, rearranging the furniture, making the sky contract till it no longer contains the horizon. When I hover, you hear cicadas crescendo. You mistake me for winter's onset, or the body as it ages. Foolish girl, you console yourself with fables where straw is spun to gold, yet a promise remains unpaid. Have you really not yet learned? Only in fairy tales is disaster averted with a secret word. In this world, magic claims no dominion. Death is a door which keeps opening. I can't possibly stay in that register. I feel so guilty <laughs> doing it. So I'll read a hopeful point. And I have my phone up here so that I can keep an eye on time because I want to make sure I leave time for us to, as I said, have a conversation. Love to know what you want to know more about. But um, one great use of a cell phone during a reading, in my opinion, is if the poet reads an ephrastic poem, as I'm going to do, and you wish to see the image. You can also just listen and tell me how well I did at bringing it forth. Or you could do both at the same time and then have a comparison. Um, this poem is for my husband, and it is also after a painter whose work I love very much, Marc Chagall. And it's a painting of his called The Dream. And I wrote this in that same time period where I was thinking about um, how much my husband also lost his mother in the same very short space of time. Sometimes it just goes like this, you know? Um, and so we were both dealing with that. And so I wrote this for him and for us. So it's a love poem. It's the best I can do, people. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the dream. But you can look up the painting now or whenever you wish. In a house that is not a house, but a boat set sailing. In a landscape where darkened clouds and hills merge, and an angel hovers, and a rooster like a sentinel guards. Or inside that house, where a man consoles a woman standing next to the bed where she sits, a vase of flowers on the table at their side. Love, find us. And find us inside the farmhouse we rented, which all winter let in cold and mice through cracks in the stone, where across the field outside our window, deer trekked, leaving tracks in snow. As lying in bed, we watched. If love is not this dream of itself, then it must be a waking to this dream. If it is not a place in time, then it must be the action of placing a vase of flowers deliberately on a table inside a square of light. Uh, I'm trying to decide which way to read them. Okay, um, I'm going to read the singing one first, and then the parable last. Um, the singing one, so it's not really a singing poem, except in my ear it is, so maybe you'll think it is too, I don't know. Um, but I really love um, singing, and I used to want to be a singer. So I think I wrote this poem just so I could keep doing it in some way. It's also a blues poem. Yes, love. Do you have a I question? Would you like to sing something? No. Okay. <laughs> if you change your mind, you can come up here and sing, you know. People would love to hear it. Okay? She. <laughs> well, maybe we could do it after the reading. I'll sing something with you. No. <laughs> okay. She. She could sing the blue out of water. She could sing the meat off a bone. 
She could sing the fire out of burning. She could sing a body out of home. She could sing the eye out of a hurricane. She could sing the fox right out its hole. She could sing the devil from the details. She could sing the lonely from a soul. She could sing a lesson in a yardstick. She could sing the duppy out of night. She could sing the shoeless out of homesick. She could sing a wrong out of a right. She could sing the prickle from the nettle. She could sing the sorrow out of stone. She could sing the tender from the bitter. She could sing the never out of gone. And the last poem is a parable. There are several parables in here. I've always liked different kinds of forms of storytelling. And I told Anna in our conversation today that the thing I think I can't do as a writer and I keep trying is to tell a story. <coughs> but this, you know, diversion of the lyric always gets in the way for me. Maybe that's not a bad thing. I mean, being a lyric poet is not a terrible thing to be. <laughs> but it's because I really want to tell stories. I like, I like a story. And so these are my attempt, I think, is these parables. They're little tiny stories, as we all know, that impart some kind of lesson. Um, and so I give you this one, if I can find it, the parable of shit and flowers. I'm so sorry. This is, a <laughs> this is my most hopeful point, so I want to end on this note, because I really am convinced this one is hopeful now. <laughs> The Parable of Shit and Flowers I am not the Lord. If I turn the other cheek, it's my ass I'm going to get. <laughs> you, from time you was a little bit, you pick up one ugly bug and call it beautiful. You stop for chat with every sore foot man in the street. Even how you is big woman, come in like you forget what people can do. Gal, you too trusting. I did tell you that long time, but I see now, you're hard of hearing. You ignorant sup, to me no know what to do with you. You don't even watch news. Stick your head in sand, like ostrich. Child, life no easy for true. You choose for believe, there's only better rose. But hear me, I did grow them. And what you have to put in dirt stink to rass. But it's what made them come up. Thank you so much. Do we have questions for Shah? Or answers, I will take those too. <laughs> I was interested in what you had to say throughout the reading about tone, mm -hmm. as if if you're going to read some sad poems, you owe your audience, your reader, yeah. <laughs> some <laughs> levity. Yes. Uh, yes. I just wonder where that, because I feel the same way, and I wonder where that comes, comes from. from. Is it, can poetry just be bludgeoning? My poetry is bludgeoning, so I'm really trying to trick you when I'm up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where does that impulse come from? Like, I, oh, I yeah. owe my readers something I, I hopeful. Absolutely agree. Um, because I would say that in isolation, the poems are hopeful, right? But that's a kind of an argument that I make with myself, and, you know, people might hear it or not. But I think a reading is a different space in which we are, di we are talking to other humans, right? And so there's a social contract there. So I know for myself, I can say, why do I feel this? It's because I'm looking at you, and I'm seeing that the poem is creating a sort of, I don't know, reaction, which is, which is good to see. But then I don't want to keep doing that. Whereas in isolation, I think we can really tolerate that, and we can also hear a lot wider range of tone even within an individual poem. Um, so I would say that's part of the reason. I think performance of a poem, which is a reading, is a different thing to me than reading it or writing it on its own. I also do think that, that hope is always there, even in the elegy. You know, so inside of the elegy is the ode. Inside of the ode is often the elegy. Those kinds of tensions that, that are irreconcilable, we hold on to those in art a lot. And so I do think that they're there inside of the poems, but I also feel as if I have to draw that out when I'm reading. 
you know. It's also, you could have stayed home and not been cold. You could have watched YouTube and found something funny to watch. So, I mean, I feel like I, I owe my audience, whichever person's chosen to come here today and any day I show up, I owe them something of a human experience. Mm -hmm. You seem to be reciting all everything you're saying from memory. Mm -hmm. I would use it. I guess you've got the text in front of you in I case do. you forget something. Or something. Yeah. But have you, have you memorized all your poems that you covered? Mm, these I've been reading from a lot, right? So I told out of this, and it's, it sounds ridiculous, but I accidentally memorized things. So the Mad Woman um, news poem I read, right? Um, that's going to come out in a book by Copper Canyon called uh, Here Poems for the Planet. It's a really cool collection, is why I'm mentioning that. Um, and they're really trying to bring awareness to the environmental, um, the environmental damage that is really potentially catastrophic right now. And I say that because they asked me to record a video that they were using to try to get a GoFundMe, not GoFundMe, I don't ever get what it was, but something like that. And I did this recording, and we were having trouble with the sound, so I did the recording like five times in a row, and then I realized I knew the poem. And so then I thought, I'll just record it this way, and it was the best recording, because then I was just looking the whole time at the camera instead of like, I was so like, this is very awkward. I tried not even to notice this camera here and try to look at you. Because that would have made me feel very awkward, right? So I guess that's what happens, is if, you, if I say a thing enough times, or read it enough times, it just starts to stick in my memory. And then why not um, deliver it that way is always my thought, because I don't think it's great for people to just come to a reading and me just be like walking from the house with my mm -hmm. earliest dreams. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not really a cool experience, right? It's or, very personal. It's very, nice. it's very immediate. I really like it. I'm yeah. very impressed. Yeah. Um, so you have this like, character of Mad Woman that mm -hmm. you wrote those oranges around, and I was just wondering, like, how was it like? Did you find yourself creating a certain kind of mythology around yourself with this character, and like what that experience was like? Because you said in one of the poems it was true, like all these things are true, but at the same time it was like third person, and what like that was kind of like writing about yourself, but like still having this distance with this mm -hmm. character of Mad Woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a lot of second person address in this book, too. Mm -hmm. And um, I played with a lot of different points of view because I was, maybe I was getting tired of the first person for a little bit. I like the first person. I work in it most of the time as a writer. But um, I don't know how to answer that exactly, except to say I wrote the book to try to answer that question. Okay. So the book embodies my search for the mad woman in my mind. I was trying to figure out who she was. Okay. And is she mythic? Is she... Is she my grandmother? Is she my mother? Is she me? Like, you know, immediate versions of me that are accessible to me. Or is she some, like my great-grandmother I've only seen pictures of, but I, you know, learned more about her that I don't know her at all. Is that her? Or is she some figure, I mean, she's a figure of culture and myth that's not of my making. You know, the mad woman lives with us and has for a long time. Um, I, you know, so I'm not new to this territory. It was just my own personal interrogation of this question, who is the mad woman and why? Why, in particular, certain women get excised from the culture? Why do we put these women outside? And particularly, any woman who behaves badly, but also women who are women of color, women who are immigrants. I mean, this is the habit, is to say you don't, you don't get to be part of the dominant culture. So I also wanted to bring her in and say, what happens if she's central now? So, um, and she's, you know, there's no article to define her in this book. There's no the, and there's no a. Uh. She's just mad woman. That's her name, is what I decided. As opposed to a mad woman or the mad woman. All of those conjure up very different iterations of being to me, that little change of a modifier. And so, yeah, I think she is me and she's not me at the same time. Yeah. It's a good question, and I'm afraid I don't have a simple answer to any good questions. Any others? This side of the room was so populous. <laughs> and, the, and the side, yes, the side that is more sparse is talking. Yes. Um, in your uh, experience of Rasta, how mm -hmm. much of an influence in your ideas, your rhythms, your, your images does, does that play in your writing? I think a lot, actually. I think a lot. 
The other influences would be the other major world religions that were in my upbringing, which would be Anglicanism, Catholicism, and Judaism. So all four of those were in my household. Um, and I now am a Jew, but I was raised as a Rasta by my parents, but their grandparents, my grandparents were, you know, half Jewish, half Anglican on one side, and then Catholic. And so I have a big weighted kind of history um, and I draw on all of it, but I think the Rasta is the earliest impression. I say still to people, I think what, I imparted, what it imparted me was a worldview that has not wavered in me. Um, so the belief in social justice, for example, and lots of religions can say that, absolutely. Hopefully that's what they do best when they do things good, right? They focus on, you know, most religions don't say, let's take from the poor and give to the rich. This is what our country currently is seeming to say. But, you know, that's not what religions tend to say, any of them. And so I'm not owning this for Rastas or for any particular sect as much to say the particular way in which that was introduced to me in the communal setting. I lived in a communal setting as a small girl. And that's a very uncommon experience, even within Kingston at that time. Please do not, under, you know, don't misunderstand if you went to Kingston in the 1970s, you would not have seen everybody being Rastafarians. Uh, that was very unusual. And so I think it was a very interesting upbringing. I was also um, surprised when I came to America how, how much cachet it got me. So I tended to stop telling people for a while. I just don't trust anything that makes people like you right away. Mm -hmm. Like if I tell people something about me and then they like me, then I start to be wondering why. You don't really know me, you know, if I went to this school or this school, if I do this job or this job, right? So Rasta became like that, and I was really shocked because my memory of it was that it was both a nice, safe space, but that I went to a Catholic school because of my grandmother, so I would leave the Rasta space, and then I would be made fun of for being a Rasta, or on the streets we'd be called Dutty Rasta. So in Jamaica, there was even this kind of weird, in the 70s when I was growing up, animosity toward it. It's only because of Bob Marley and his popularity in America and elsewhere, I think that people outside of Jamaica thought, oh my God, that's so cool. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yes. <laughs> you know, so, um, so it's a complicated answer, but I would say entirely, and at the same time, I don't practice as a Rasta. No, I just feel still that that worldview was foundational. Uh, like Robert, I was struck by the fact that you were reciting so many of your poems from memory, and I'm, I am also noticed that you commented that you're sort of obsessed with memory or find that. Uh, do you, so I'm interested in whether your education included a lot of memorization. There was a time when it was a pretty standard component of a primary school uh, yes. experience, particularly in, in Jamaica. British, mm -hmm. British and former, formerly British colonies. Well, it's still the British system uh, we and, use and, there, and so, so yes, I'm, absolutely. I'm wondering, and I'm wondering if you see ways that that has influenced your poetry today. I think today. very, very much. I mean, I remember things from when I was small, you know, that, that are just snatches of language that, that still come in my head that I haven't forgotten. So, um, that's partly, I think, my education, which was much more rote. But there's something beautiful about rote learning too. The, you know, the notion that the only way to know things is to know nothing is strange, right? Like you just have ideas and then you have no need of information to attach anything to. I don't know how you learn that way because it seems like you need a context or a container in which to understand it. Just an example for you would be try reading something you know, in physics if you haven't studied physics in a long time. You know, how, how are you gonna understand the concepts when you don't have the lexicon? So I think for me, that's what it's always about, is the, the poems that are there are all the lexicon that I've absorbed. You know, all the language that I'm absorbing is more present for me when I know it by heart. And I make my students memorize poems, so if you ever work with me as a student, you will have to, or get the privilege of, depending on how you look at it, the pleasure of learning a poem by heart. I make them do it twice in the semester and stand up and recite, and it's very foreign for a lot of students to do this activity. But I say, look, if you can do this, it's, it's great. You overcome some fear of public speaking. You test your memory to, you push yourself. It's a cognitive exercise too, right? And it's good to push ourselves. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, I did it young. I also was in theater, so, and I sang. So you have to memorize things. Nobody wants you up there with your text. You know, <laughs> don't get, unless you're doing a reading of a play, you're not allowed to have your book in hand. 
you have to go off script. So I think that probably helped. Um, even when I came to America, I, I did that for so many years. But do some of you memorize poems? How many of you in here? Yes, 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 yes. I used to have my students do. Yeah. Well, it's, with my yeah. Can I ask? Can, why? Why did you do it? <laughs> Body and your soul, right? Um, why do you do it? Well, I'm an actor. You, yes. Me, and no, the gentleman no. behind you, too. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't That's know. okay. No, it's hard to know where I'm pointing. He's back there <laughs> yes. selling the books for us. You can talk, too. I mean, my, when I was in high school, they kind of had us do it as well. And yeah. Well, it's kind of primarily my Latin and kind of poetry and mm -hmm. humanities classes. I mean, mm -hmm. the tallest number five still haunts my head. Matilda's <laughs> <laughs> uh, was great, though. Yeah. So, his elegy. I took my recited it the other day. I'm just like, okay, I'm doing it again. <laughs> yeah. You know, learning a. To, have you ever recited a poem in another language that you don't speak? That's always interesting, too. You're just really learning rhythms now. You know, I love language so much. I embarrass my children by trying to learn every single language I ever hear. You know, just immediately I hear a new language and I'm like, how do you say that? Let me try again. Well, you well, know, being a and choral singer is interesting that way because yeah. I, you do that all the time. You do it all the while. Yeah. I just think it's a great gift to give yourself. You know, like the way you would learn a piece of music and you love it more for having learned it because it's yours now. You own yeah. it differently. If you learn a poem, um, you just love it. So, on that note, can I finish with someone else's that I've memorized that I love? Is that a good way to finish, Anna? Time, yeah, Elizabeth. Okay. Ode to the maggot. <laughs> Brother of the blowfly and godhead, you work magic over battlefields and slabs of bad pork. Yes, you go to the root of all things. You are sound and mathematical, ontological and lustrous. You cast spells over beggars and kings behind the stone door of Caesar's tomb, or split trench in a field of ragweed. No creed or decree can outlaw you as you take every living thing apart. Little master of earth, no one gets to heaven without going through you first. <laughs> so, I missed a word, and I missed a line, just so you know. <laughs> as soon as I went past them, I knew I missed them, and I said that point so many times. So if you go find it, you'll have even more than I just gave to you. <laughs> so lesson two, you just keep going. Nobody notices. And the poet is Yusef Kumanyaka, the great American poet, still alive, I think. So thank you for your time. Stay warm. And I'm happy to hang around and talk more. Thanks. Thank you. And the books are in the back for sale. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>